This is episode 18 of the Home and Family Culture Podcast. I'm Jody Chafee, and in this episode, I interviewed MJ DeMarco, author and entrepreneur. Welcome to the Home and Family Culture Podcast, where I discuss how families can discover and design their collective vision, values, beliefs, and traditions that influence their family culture. The purpose of my podcast is to interview experts who can offer tips and tools to aid families in the process of developing their family culture, and also successful individuals whose success was influenced by their family culture. For more information or to subscribe, go to homeandfamilyculture.com, or you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest at Family Culture Podcast, and on Twitter at underscore Family Culture. You can tune in on my site or on the variety of podcast broadcasting apps like iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, TuneIn Radio, and even on YouTube. Just search Home and Family Culture with the ampersand between Home and Family Culture. Please remember to like, comment, share, and rate on whatever medium you choose. I would love to hear from you. MJ DeMarco is a semi-retired entrepreneur, investor, self-made millionaire, and international best-selling author of The Millionaire Fastlane and Unscripted, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of of, Excuse me, uh, The Pursuit of Entrepreneurship. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) But he currently is the founder of Viperian Corporation, a small publishing company and the Fastlane Forum, a worldwide global business community with over 40,000 entrepreneurs reg- registered and over 500,000 contributions. Welcome, MJ. I'm so excited to have you. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you've acquired your, your lifestyle. Sure. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of kind of knew early on that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, uh, Actually, the the entire thing was spurred on when I was uh, 13, 14 years old when I saw a a Lamborghini parked Mm -hmm. outside an ice cream store. And I was curious on what the guy did, what the the driver of the car did. And he was um, a young guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that kind of was uh, kind of strange to me. But he said he was an entrepreneur. So that kind of planted that seed that, uh, you know, wow, you can, um, you know, you assume the guy's rich. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, oh, this, this is interesting. And I started looking into entrepreneurship. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized it was uh, so much more than just, oh, you know, you can make a lot of money. Uh, but it was about really living life the way you want to live life, uh, mm-hmm. having control over your life, having control over your time. So, uh, you know, it, it took me a good 10 years before I actually succeeded as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, I owned an internet company for about 12 years. I was able to sell it twice mm-hmm. uh, to a company out in San Francisco, both times. And then um, after I sold it the second time, kind of went into a, I would call a semi-retirement, which allowed me to write these books. And now Mm -hmm. I'm a publishing company and I operate a a global community filled with entrepreneurs who want to live the unscripted life um, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of entrepreneurship. So, and that's um, really my objective uh, in my quote, semi-retirement is to spread this message that entrepreneurship is not just a career it is a lifestyle it mm-hmm. is a it is a way to approach a world that just is really changing and a lot of those changes are not for the better um so uh it's yeah. giving people the opportunity to say hey there's there's just another alternative out there and it goes much beyond just you know a career yeah i mean i i read your books looking for I want to say redemption <laughs> mm-hmm. because, you know, I started reading some, uh, some financial books my husband and I find ourselves basically trapped in the corporate world. People of course recommend, you know, Dave Ramsey and the richest man in Babylon and, and even, even rich dad, poor dad, which, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, that one helped me to create a better mindset. Uh, 
But what can you tell us about these financial paths and what is flawed about the slow lane mentality that you describe in your book? Well, the slow lane mentality um, for your listeners is Mm -hmm. this idea that if you give up 50 years of your life in a job and you're ridiculously frugal living beyond, you know, living below your means uh, and giving all those savings uh, to Wall Street, that eventually one day you're going to be rich. You're going to be a millionaire. You're the millionaire next door, as they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And it's, it's just utter, I I go as far as saying it's a scam. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of these scripted dogmas out there that is peddled by a trillion dollar financial industry, a trillion dollar indebted government. It's all a part of a system to be, let's be honest, to create economic slaves, mm-hmm. economic slaves in the Monday through Friday slave system, economic slaves in the 50 year Wall Street system. Uh, and, and when you look into this stuff more deeply, it is really uh, deeply concerning. Now, the slow lane is all predicated on compound interest. Uh, mm-hmm. And you've probably heard that before, which is, you know, invest $10 a month for the next 50 years. And yeah. after 50 years, you're going to have X millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Well, that's absolutely true. The, the yeah. math is math is true. I mean, we can't get beyond that. Right. But it's not because the math, it's not a scam because the math doesn't work. It does. Yeah. It's because the application of it is not put into the proper context of inflation uh, mm-hmm. Reckless government spending, which is is uh, has not ceased and will yeah. never cease, mm-hmm. uh, and a limited lifespan, and as, as a very variety of other factors, including are you going to have a job for fifty years? Mm-hmm. You know, so when they say, "Oh, you'll have you know two million dollars by the time you're six, you know, sixty five years old," well, <laughs> is that two million dollars? Is that going to be enough to buy what a Chevy? Is it going to be enough to pay the rent for that? I mean, we don't know. Yeah. So, and all these compound interest calculations are always based upon an asset class. An asset class has to have an interest rate. An asset class says basically that it will grow 5%, 6%, 7%. -hmm. So the risk-free rate of a um, the asset class uh, that should be used is the uh, three-month treasury, which currently pays a pound about 0.002%. <laughs> so that's the risk-free rate. So the whole objective here is you for you to take risk. Yeah. And that means that's where Wall Street comes in. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this, this is an entirely different book I could write about, but... <laughs> My objective here is to say, you know what, there's another, there's another way to do this, and that's not to trade away 50 years of your life in hopes to have a nice retirement at 65. My, my favorite saying is the greatest con of humanity is going to school Monday through Friday for 18 years so you can have the privilege of going to work Monday through Friday for the next 50. Yeah. And that's essentially what the scripted system is teaching everyone. Yeah. And that's so in, in my vernacular, when I talk about these kinds of things with people, we, I, I follow leadership education type style of for homeschooling and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be homeschooling, but what they call it, they call this scripted mentality, they call it the conveyor belt, mm-hmm. you know, where it's like, you know, we send our kids to school so that they can get, learn how to line up and get straight grades and and they get their stamp of approval and move on to the next, you know, it's like they follow instruction, do yeah. what you're told, uh, you know, sign up for that 401k because, yep. you know, here's what's going to, you know, here's how it works. And you just be diligent. See, the problem is if you're diligent for the 50 years and you find out that it doesn't work yeah. because uh, the government was reckless or inflation went crazy mm-hmm. or, the economy bombed out and you didn't have a job or you get sick. There's no yeah. do-overs because yeah. those 50 years are gone and, and you have limited life left. Yeah. I mean, I I have to admit when I first started reading your book about the the sidewalk and the slow lane, I was kind of in tears. I'm like, oh, it's, it's so true. And, and what, this is the life we've subscribed ourselves to. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, and it was kind of, it was kind of, it was very eye-opening. It was kind of heartbreaking, but it was also very eye-opening. Mm-hmm. And, and you spend a good portion of the, the, the millionaire fast lane 
explaining about these these all these um, paths that we are constantly being fed and taught how to follow. And, and I appreciated that because it really um, spelled out how very true all of that, that perspective is that, Mm -hmm. you know, my parents, they're still working. They're still gonna, they're probably gonna work themselves to death. And that's just the way that that's how the slowing is. But but we, we, it's like, we forget that sometimes. And because then, and nobody it, wakes us up to that. Yes, and, and, and it's in a sec, in, in effect, we become willing economic slaves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, and, what is the alternative? You well, know, it, the alternative is understanding that we're being gamed. First of all, yeah. Um, so you once you understand that, you get to see things as the way they are, mm-hmm. as opposed to the way they want you to think it is. Um, so once you see that you're being gamed into the system, it becomes much easier to escape and not participate in the game and just, uh, just simply acknowledge it. You yeah. know, a good example is television. I don't watch mm-hmm. a lot of television. So when there's people talking about, oh, you know, HBO killed some character and, you know, I don't give a <gasps> I, I'm sorry about the language, but I don't care. You know, some football team lost in the fourth quarter. See, that's a scripted obedience tool mm-hmm. because we have to assuage ourselves from the system that we've, you know, we've pretty much subscribed to and said and resigned ourselves to. So that's why TV is so important because people need to assuage uh, the fact that they resigned the fact that their dream is dead. They're just not buried yet, but their dream has been dead since, you know, since they graduated college or since they've been put into the system. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, you know, it's so sad that people do not see that they're just, they're almost being puppeted without any thought to why do we do things the way they're being done? Mm. They don't question it. They don't like Monday through Friday, Monday right. through Friday is a human construct. Yeah. Uh, your dog, if you have a dog, he doesn't know it's Monday. He doesn't know it's Sunday. They're all the same. Mm-hmm. Same with aliens. If an alien right. came, to the, came to the planet, their supercomputer would say, okay, they have one day revolutions of 24 hours. But Friday, Monday through Friday is a human construct to instruct, to uh, institute obedience into, this, into the work slave system. And that's when people resign to themselves that it's perfectly okay to trade away my Monday through Friday in a job I necessarily probably wouldn't be doing if I didn't need to in order to get paid Saturday and Sunday. Mm-hmm. It's a five for two trade. Yeah. And it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. It's like when, when you describe that, and I know you've posted something somewhere that's like, this is like the matrix. You're going to take the red pill or the blue pill. And if you take that, you know, you wake up to this reality. Look, we are just a bunch of batteries in this system. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and it's everywhere. It's 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 really has saturated our culture. Um, I mean, when I started, at, even after reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, it woke me up to to some of this mindset. And I think I'd started reading your book by this point when I'd watched the movie Sing. Have you ever seen that movie? It's a cartoon. Mm-mm. So it's about these people who want to participate in a, a voice competition. Mm-hmm. And well, they're not people; they're animals, <laughs> but they represent people. And yeah. Anyways, um, but it's, it's this guy who has a theater and it's failing. And so his last ditch effort is to put out there this competition to bring in people. And, and he accidentally says that the prize money is going to be $100,000. And stay, stick with me about this because <laughs> it's about, so it's a, it, uh, on the surface, it's about a singing competition. And I'm a singer, so I was like, oh, that'll be so fun to watch. Mm-hmm. But after having this mindset, I was watching it and I felt really depressed by the end because first of all, it was about people wanting to, lo- to win a lottery, you know, at, to, about a skill that they may not have necessarily developed or worked on to find to how, how to find an outlet or make an impact and things like that. And then all of the characters that were involved had financial issues. And so it was like this huge uh, tribute almost to our culture of you know, the koala had a fan, uh, koala, the, the guy with the theater had mm-hmm. a failing business. 
there was a guy who was who thought he had the the prize money in the bag, so he took out a line of credit and became mm-hmm. and gambled it. There's a guy who's a thief. There's a family that the dad just slaves away constantly and doesn't even interact with his family. Mm-hmm. And and so that was like to me that was what the movie was about. And I felt yeah. kind of depressed that this is this is basically our culture. Our culture, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And it's something that um, it was normalizing it. It is, yeah, exactly, yeah. It was normalizing it, and because it wasn't like you went to this movie and went, "Wow, that was depressing," because all these people are struggling, and <laughs> mm-hmm. you go to the movie and you go, "Yeah, that's life." <laughs> yeah. And and everybody wishes that they could find this golden ticket that's going to rescue them from from all of these different ways of of living that are that are essentially either the sidewalk that you describe in your book or yes. the slow lane. And so how do we, you know, when we, when we see the language is everywhere, it permeates sure. our culture, you know, and that's how we were raised. Yes. When, you, when you're little kids, you say, what are you going to be when you grow up? And you think that that's it. Whatever I choose, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. So tell us about the alternative that you've described. You know, what is the fast lane exactly? Mm-hmm. It, it, well, it, and you described that movie, and it just, I haven't seen the movie, but it just, I'm thinking to myself here, you know, there's 10 year olds and 11 year olds watching this. Oh, yeah. And they're My being, and they're being trained to think, okay, this is what I, this is what life is. This is what I need to expect. Yeah. And it's absolutely, that's part of a, a scripted dogma. So training people to become uh, these slaves in, these, in the system. And that, oh, that's just the way it is. That's mm-hmm. just the way it is. You know, another saying I like to say is if you accept conventional wisdom from conventional people living conventional lives, <laughs> can you expect to be anything but conventional? Yeah. So the fast lane is a, a philosophy of entrepreneurship uh, predicated on a series of different commandments that allows an individual to inject massive value into the world. And when I say massive value, that, that I don't want to scare people into thinking they need, to, they need to be the next Elon Musk or Bill Gates. That is okay. far from true. But injecting value into society, almost serving the game instead of playing the game. So when we partake in an entrepreneurship of, of, of a fast lane nature, it allows us to explode our income, explode our, our, our net worth pretty, dramatic, pretty dramatically. And we're talking about, you know, instead of making $30,000, $40,000 a year, you could go to $30,000, $40,000 a month. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, let's face it, money is very important in a scripted society. I retired 35 years early. Mm-hmm. And I was able to do that. Not because I created some huge company. You know, the most employees I ever had at any one time, I think was four or five. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't some huge company, but it was huge enough. It was big enough in my world to make a huge impact in my life where I was able to accumulate money rather quickly. I was making six figures monthly. And I I made a point of saving a lot of that money and not spending it on frivolous stuff. Mm -hmm you know, designer clothes that would be out of fashion in six months or whatnot. So the fast lane is a series of commandments that outline entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial venture where you can scale your income very, you know, large, or you can scale your asset value or your net worth uh, very large to impact to the point where you start to realize, I don't need to wait 50, 60 years for Wall Street to give me a millionaire miracle. Yeah, I can do this in three, four, five, six years. And I see this on my forum all the time when yeah. people build a business from the ground up following these principles and they, and they realize I just woke up and I made $700. Mm-hmm. And when they see that there's a point of intersection where your time has been divested from the act of making money, meaning you make money 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's always on and that's one of the one of the fast lane principles is to divest yourself from the act of trading your time for money Mm -hmm. and that's one of the core reasons why i was able to retire 
30, 35 years early because I divested myself from the act of trading my time for money. Yeah. So now I make money 24 hours a day, seven days a week on holidays, on Christmas, on things. Every single, I have not been off the clock <laughs> since I think 1997. Uh-huh. So, and that's how you create wealth. Okay. is you create these structures that have the ability to earn income regardless of what you're doing. So that, in essence, is a fast lane entrepreneurial venture. And it's not, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are not engaged in these kind of metrics. They're still trading their time for money. Yeah. Uh, so if you're a consultant and you don't consult, you don't make money. So that's, right. there's a very distinct thing there. Is yeah. So like in Kiyosaki terms, it's you're, go, you're still on the what the left side of the quadrant if, yeah, you're an e, um, if you're an employee or a self-employed you're you're still trading time for money sure i think he i think he called it the s quadrant i don't remember yeah. it's been long mm-hmm. yeah so that's that's um one of the core elements of a fast lane system is um it's called the commandment of time uh-huh. and that's uh that's when you create something that is separate from your time and a good example is right here i'm doing this podcast with you and it will, you know, it will, I will cost an hour of my life, but I enjoy doing it because I'm spreading my word. Mm-hmm. But after I'm done here, this message will continue to resonate. Yeah. You know, uh, let's say you, you, you succeed widely and you're on Good Morning America or, or <laughs> something crazy. All of a sudden, you know, this work I did, a, you know, a long time ago is still out there. It's still, yeah. it's still generating, it's still spreading my message. And so I, that's where I invest my time. Yeah. Uh, so entrepreneurship does take a lot of time. Let's let's be clear. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that it's all fun and games and you're on a hammock on a beach. Right. <laughs> the, the distinction here is to invest your time into a system that not only pays you money, but it pays you time. Yeah. The, the economic slavery system is predicated on trading your time for money and then it's done. Yeah. I trade my time into a system that pays money and time. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why I've been able to be fortunate enough to have, you know, to be able to retire early, do what I want, write what I want, not care what a publishing company thinks about my book. Too bad I'm doing it. Uh I have that freedom now. I have that, I have divested myself from the scripted dogma and the scripted institutions, the scripted authoritarian systems. So that eventually is your, is your end goal. Yeah. So what are, can you give us some examples of some of those systems that people can invest their time in that can create a fast lane like that? Sure. Um, Well, anything that is separate from your time, anything that is separate from your existence. So I've written uh, two books. I'm working on a third. Those books exist separate from me. Uh, If I die tomorrow, heaven forbid, those books will still exist. They will still sell. Um, It could be a product, an invention. A food product, any, anything that can sit on a shelf, anything that can be sold on a website. Mm-hmm. So that's how you separate yourself from time. In more human resource systems, uh, is usually the worst type of system because then you have to hire people. Right. Um, so in the case of a consultant, you would have to hire other consultants. Mm-hmm. Those generally are the types of arrangements I generally like to steer people away from because they're much harder to scale. So as an author of a book or, or a product, so let's say you, you have a food product that people love, replicating that food product among millions is much easier than trading your time up into 24 hours. See, we're limited by uh, the mathematical equations we attach ourselves to. Yeah. So math, math is the fundamental law of the universe. So if we're objecting to create wealth – for the purpose of creating our own freedom, we have to attach ourselves to these proper equations that allow wealth to happen. Mm-hmm. So the, the slave system is about trading your time. So there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh-huh. There's only one, uh, you know, our lifespan is what, 78 years. So look at those numbers, 78, 24. These aren't really lar- good numbers to be creating wealth with. Right. So when we create systems that have unlimited metrics or unlimited mathematics, suddenly getting wealthy becomes a probable outcome. 
Mm-hmm. Not, you know, I'm going to say it's likely, but it becomes probable. So mm-hmm. if you're working a job that pays $40,000 a year, I can tell you unequivocally 100% that your odds of getting wealthy is zero. Right. However, if you are inventing a product and it's being well received by the marketplace and it could be replicated fairly easily, uh-huh. I can tell you then that your odds of getting wealthy have just jumped from zero, I don't know, to 10, 15 percent, 20 percent. So these are the types of things we want to think about. These are these are the equations we attach ourselves to. Uh, I wrote two books. I can easily print a million books without issue. You know, one day Mark, Mark Cuban may say, "Oh, I recommend the Millionaire Fast Lane," mm-hmm. and all of a sudden I saw you know an extra hundred thousand books just like that. Wow! Yeah. So, so that's again, I've attached myself to these proper equations that allow wealth to to happen. And so, how has our the corporate world changed? Of late, you know, lately, so that it makes it a lot easier, really, to develop these kinds of systems. Well, we live in a wonderful time where the world's knowledge is at your fingertips. You mm-hmm. you can learn anything that you need to learn. And when I reflect on my life and where I have come from, all the all the things that I have made money with have not come from things I learned in college. They mm-hmm. came from things I actively sought out to learn. So we want to always accept that learning doesn't end at graduation. It just begins. Yeah. You have to become a lifelong learner. I just posted something the other day that, say, that said, failed entrepreneurs let their education lead the opportunity, mm-hmm. while successful entrepreneurs let the opportunity lead their education. So when people like to use the crow, oh, I don't know how to do that. Oh, I'm not good at that. I'm not. Right. These are crutches. Yeah. Um, these are identity uh, crutches that allow you to escape doing the work. Um, it's also a part of a fixed mindset, which basically yeah. says that you can't change anything. Uh, where we want a growth mindset that says you can change anything if you put your mind to it. Yeah. And one of the thoughts, because I saw that post and I was actually going to ask you about it. And so I'm glad you brought it up because the way that I see the fast lane is it's a process. Mm -hmm. that it's ultimately, it's kind of like a scientific process. Like people don't think about their careers as, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try this and work at it, test my hypothesis, test my theories, work at it, work at it, see where it takes me. And if it fails, go, oh, oh, well, I'm not going to move on to do that anymore. But that, you know, part of, part of being able to set up systems is that you you have to have that growth mindset. You have to be able to keep learning and and pursuing things that will help to advance whatever it is, the barriers that you need to break through in order to develop and create those systems. And um, and that's it that concept of learning to the opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's uh, so it's this leadership ed type of education that I that I try to talk about with my family is it's kind of like that where if you want to get off the conveyor belt, then your kids need to be able to pursue their own education and yes. develop the capacity to learn and not just, so you're not, you don't teach your kids what to learn. You teach them how to learn. Correct. And so then that, that allows them the ability to, yes, to work and, at. And once those. you see, once you are educated on the logical fallacies, the biases that, that all go into uh, scripted dogma. I mean, we haven't even discussed the mainstream media, right. um, the education, uh, educational systems that are complicit. And once you start to, you know, take the veil off all this stuff uh, using, you know, proven psychological concepts, cognitive biases, and so forth, mm-hmm. it's it's almost disturbing um, what's going yeah. on. But in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, it, it, and you, you you kind of touched on this. It's a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. This is not a career. This is a lifestyle. It's like we really have to match our expectations to what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. So when I say, you know, you build a system, you get away from trading your time for money, yeah, 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 all that stuff. This this doesn't happen overnight. It could take a couple of years. But what you have to do is expect it to be uh, riddled with some failure, riddled with some trials. It's all about the process. It's like baseball. 
Yeah. You don't say, you know what, I'm going to succeed as a baseball player. You go up to the, the home plate, you take three swings and you strike out and say, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to be a baseball player. I quit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's not how it works. You continually drive to the plate. You continually swing. And eventually you start getting acclimated to what it takes to hit the ball. Yeah. Um, so and that's learning ways to refine that skill, not just yes. expecting that, oh, I have a talent for this, but then I strike out, I'm done. Well, then where's that talent? Talent doesn't translate to anything until it becomes a skill that you've developed to Correct. turn it into something. Yeah. And then you even mentioned this um, before is, uh, you know, with your podcast here, you're relatively new at it. Um, and you don't know where it's going to take you. But the key is you're doing something. Mm-hmm. You, you, and you're refining your process. You're relearning. You're, and you, you never know what's going to. You might you might have a aha moment with one of your guests, or mm-hmm. or the guest says, "Hey, you know, that's um, you know, I'd like to partner with you on something." Mm-hmm. The ability of just being out there and doing yeah. something, and, and and getting the getting these systems in place and seeing where it takes you. Uh, is the essence of the process. It's not, yeah. uh, you know, it's the old saying, it's not the, it's not the destination, it's the yeah. journey. And it's, yeah. it's who we become in this process. And I think Brene Brown would call it daring greatly. Yeah, that you would, yeah. you rise up, you just do something despite, you know, yeah, you're going to be vulnerable, but you just keep doing it. And, and, and also this idea you talk about a lot in your book that it all comes back to making an impact. You know, although the title of your book is The Millionaire Fast Lane, mm-hmm. and people are like, oh, millionaire, this is a get rich thing. It's not about getting rich quick if you aren't willing to go through the process of making an impact, creating something, a system that makes a difference. And something that I've, I've you know, my brother and I, we think about entrepreneurial stuff all the time. And, and his wife is like, what's the big deal? Why do you, why keep hanging up on this? And, and, and I was thinking about it, and it's something that, is mine and I'm able to create it Mm -hmm. and put it out into the world. And that can be scary because there's a lot of trolls out there that want to put you down and sitting out in the arena, (laughs) not inside the arena, but out in the stands, you know, saying, Oh, what are you doing? But yeah. Yeah. And so, but it's about, it's about getting up and doing something and creating something that's yours and making an impact. It's about creating value, relative value for the marketplace. Focus on relative value and your messaging. And eventually the money comes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And that's a very important distinction uh, because there's a lot of young people that are all about the money. Mm -hmm. I want to make money. (laughs) What what can I do to make money? And instantly I tell them, you have it all backwards, son. Yeah. It's not about money. It's about creating relative value, uh, injecting an impact into the world, and eventually the money will come. And the ultimate pinnacle of Unscripted, uh, that's my second book, mm-hmm. is to free yourself from the, from, the, from the binds of authority, the binds mm-hmm. of money, the binds of financial encumbrance, and I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be able to go through life and really do what you want to do and, and not really have to worry about money. And that's kind of been the two frameworks of how I've written my book is a lot of publishers wouldn't, wouldn't publish my book because they're kind of all over the place. It, they're very broad based. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So a publisher would say, oh, no, we, we don't want to publish that. Well, I can say F you, I'm publishing it <laughs> yeah. because yeah, I'm unscripted. Mm-hmm. I, I can do what I want. And this is, so if you have a, a long-term vision, uh, say you want to op- you have a dog rescue, you want to, you know, help underprivileged youth, you want to, you know, whatever it is, this could be the conduit to that because it's very hard to make a difference in life when you can't even put a, put food on the table. Yeah. So when you get to put yourself in a position, this is why Elon Musk is diving into all kinds of crazy stuff Mm -hmm. because money is no longer an issue. And that's where you can make the greatest impact. A lot of entrepreneurs, when they make a huge fortune, they go on and do some really weird stuff, some charitable stuff. It's because they know now they can make a difference. So that is the ultimate long game view of unscripted fast lane entrepreneurship is for us 
to put ourselves in a position to make a difference in something that's important to us. And it could be, it could be anything to anybody. It, that's not the point of this. Right. So when we, when we talk about this in the context of raising our, our kids and they are constantly being berated by this message, um, how can we, how can we help our kids to recognize the messages and help them to um, shape their goals around being more entrepreneurial, more unscripted? Well, it depends on the individual. Um, mm-hmm. There are a lot of people who are perfectly fine with the system and being <laughs> involved in the system. Mm-hmm. It's like that old Matrix movie where the guy, yeah. the guy with the stake, he, he's like, I want to be put back in the Matrix. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are a lot of people like that. So um, the best we can do is just education, is, is, is train them to see the system and how it works. And you do that by educating them on the biases, the cognitive biases mm-hmm. that are everywhere, mm-hmm. um, the logical fallacies that are being used by politicians on both sides of the aisle. The government uses it. The mainstream media uses it. Once you get to see how the system works and you, and you start to unpierce the veil, mm-hmm. it's much easier to convince somebody, or not convince somebody, but to open their eyes to you know what, I don't want to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, My life is more important than a stupid baseball game uh, (laughs) that I'm going to bribe myself with because I hate my Monday through Friday. (laughs) Um, So it's all about education and having them see both sides, Mm -hmm. Uh, having them be able to ascertain the data instead of putting them in the scripted echo chamber of this is the way it is, um, this is how it's done, and anything out of this deviation is you're you're an outcast. Right. Well, and times are changing so much. There are people who work that in in Microsoft or whatever don't even have a college degree because they've been able to self-educate themselves sure. to to the those fields and things. And and so, you know, when I was reading your book and I was thinking about my own college education, it was like, I think growing up, I believed that college was this golden ticket to life. Yeah. It was, a, it was an end rather than a means to an end. And, and so I never, you know, go, if I were to go back and do it all over again, I would probably, you know, do things that develop myself. You know, when you talk about the process, creating value it's not even it's not even just about the whatever system you put you're creating because it's also about yourself and mm-hmm. the, the value that you as a person are developing yeah. and, and creating with with your experience with your education and um, you know if if I could go back and do it again I would have studied things that would have not made college at the end but mm-hmm. just a means to an end where okay I prepared myself and I've been able to uh, if I did want to go to college, that that's just something to check off my my list of yeah. I've developed this skill already and college is just to refine it. You're the, you're the CEO of your life. And the problem nowadays, you know, college was the golden ticket 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Now, now it's part of the scripted machine where we're educating our kids. Um, first of all, we're throwing them into debt, six figures in debt, to have a college degree that has no marketable skill whatsoever in the marketplace. So that, that makes economic slaves. Yeah. And, again, and this is where we have to educate our kids that, Oh, I want to go to school and become an art history major. Well, great. <laughs> That's what you want to do. Um, you're going to be, you're going to become part of the system because I can guarantee you there's probably no jobs in art history that's going to pay your debt. So you're going to be put into a system, yeah. into having a job you really don't like um, because you were told, you were, oh, you know, this is, this is the way things are done. You think about that is just millions and millions of parents are sending their kids to college based on that's just the way things are done yeah. without any thought to the economic impact it has on their kid, not to mention the economic outlook for the degree pursuit that they're taking. Yeah. Uh, so we and have... It's, it's sad because that 30 years ago, yeah, maybe. 
at the middle, sure. you know, but our, and our education system is still stuck in more than 30 years <laughs> of yeah, a you system. bankrupt uh, student debt. Isn't that convenient? Yeah, right. Uh, so <laughs> it's, uh, again, it's all about economic slavery. And another thing I want to mention is that's quite important is entrepreneurship. When I say it's more about, it's more than a career, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's very important because they have proven, they have actually done studies on this, that a person's happiness quotient is 50% determined by autonomy. Mm -hmm. And entrepreneurship is the career that offers autonomy. In my second book, I mentioned that one of the happiest days of my life was when I realized I was free from a job and that I was able to self-direct my company to pay the bills and, and to get by. I wasn't rich. I didn't have millions of dollars or anything, but I was just ecstatic because mm -hmm. I was now writing my own check. And that's because I had autonomy. Auto you have no autonomy when a, an alarm clock is forcing you up at 6 a.m. and putting you in traffic uh, five days a week. That's no autonomy. You have no autonomy when the boss tells you to do X, Y, and Z. You have no autonomy when the boss says, no, you can't have a four-week vacation <laughs> to cruise the uh, Mediterranean. You can't do that. That's no autonomy. Yeah. So when we create autonomy, 50% of our happiness bank is filled up. This is why you don't even have to be a successful entrepreneur. You can be a pay-the-bills entrepreneur and still be <laughs> right. Yeah. Still be free. Yes. How do we introduce these concepts to children? First of all, it depends on the child. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, uh, um, a teenager in my life mm -hmm. who suddenly, who to be honest, wasn't interested mm -hmm. in entrepreneurship. And I understand that. I respect that. But all of a sudden, he became interested when he got his first job. <laughs> right. Uh, and his first job is, wasn't something he particularly, in fact, he hated it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he had a boss he didn't like. Not at all. all of a sudden, he's interested. Right. Oh, really? <laughs> See, so. Uh, I think that is one of the things that I did appreciate about Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If you've read that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like he, he starts out, his rich dad says, okay, I want you to work for me for next to nothing. And, and, and you know, after a few weeks, Robert's like, I hate this. And he's like, okay, now you've gotten a taste of what it's like to be employed. Mm -hmm. You know, and. And so, I mean, it's kind of hard to think of how do we, how do we give our kids a taste, you know, early on so that, you know, because really the earlier, the better, if they get yeah. a taste and of what it's like. Again, it, it comes down to education and expectation. Right. And the, the old, the saying I like to say is people don't want to be told the fire is hot. Yeah. They need to feel the burn. Yeah. And so unfortunately with a lot of children, it, it, that, um, young young adults, I should say, that becomes the the norm. Is they yeah. do not know what it's like to be in a job that they absolutely hate. To go on to the Obamacare exchange and see that your health insurance is going to be nineteen hundred dollars a month mm -hmm. because um, you know that's the law that they passed and, mm -hmm. and that's what it is in Arizona. I'm um, as an unemployed or excuse me, a, a, an entrepreneur who does not have employment, normal employment, that's mm -hmm. what it is. So once you get into the system, it becomes much easier to want to be open and receptive to the escapes. So with my podcast, one of the things that we do talk about with is, you know, these, this idea that your family culture is what you default to. It's your norms. It's what you are used to doing. And, and one of the reasons why, you know, like I want to talk to you and other people who who want to disrupt these norms a little bit is okay. so that people can really analyze and evaluate what are those norms? What is their default beliefs that they have to, to analyze them, figure out what is working, what's not working and to set a new course for their family. Yeah. And, and are they, are they beliefs or are they facts? Yeah. Monday through Friday is a belief system, right? That's a belief system. And, and no one says you can't have, you don't have to work on Monday. That's a societal construct. Mm -hmm. And as an, as a, as I've been an entrepreneur for 20, 25 years, there are days when I don't even know it's Thursday. I go through the entire day 
<laughs> and I'll be like, gee, traffic is a little heavier today. And it's only two o'clock. <laughs> and then I realize it's Friday. It's not Thursday. It's Friday. Right. So that's when you truly get out of the system, when you realize that all the days they feel the same and they feel great. Yeah. I'm not yeah. waiting for Friday to feel great. <laughs> Every day is great because, again, I have autonomy. I have choices. I, yeah. I can look in the store and say, I can, I can buy that and not worry about it. Uh, I can write things that may be controversial or not very pal- palatable and get you away with it. freedom. When I think about how we can influence our family culture, I think that it comes back to what we talked about of, you know, keep studying, keep learning about this, mm-hmm. keep finding a solution. You know, I think, yeah, once you don't really get a taste for it until you've experienced the, that environment that you want to get out of. But if you find a conflict, you find a problem, then you need to search for a solution. And Reading your books, reading books about, you know, we, we mentioned Mindset, and that's a book by Carol Dweck. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a great book to read. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, Grit by Angela Duckworth is an excellent book to read. You know, that's something, you know, you just, when you study those things, they become a part of your family narrative and the sure. vision that you have for your family. The, the power to make choices. The power to analyze information and extract it from the biases that are being presented in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's very hard to look at both sides of an issue because they're always presented to the filter of bias. Right. The filter of the narrative they're trying to, you know, promote, like, uh, you know, uh, the chart that says, oh, here's, here's what saving $50 a year for the next 50 years, what you could have after 50 years. And you look at the, the author of that wonderful chart and it's JP Morgan Chase asset right. management. Okay. Right. Well, see, that's what I'm saying is you can still look at the information, but once you start the looking at who is the purveyors yeah. of this information, it becomes easier to extract fact from fiction mm-hmm. and really come to grasp what, what is going on around us. Can you think of, or do you know of any other books that kind of, help with opening up the mind, our mindset about the, the, the biases or, or things like that that can help teach uh, our kids to come out the of biases, it? biases, there's a, a book by, uh, I think it's called You Are, you Are More Dumb <laughs> uh-huh. uh, by David McRaney, I think. Okay. Is his name. But he goes through a lot of these biases and, and being able to identify them when you're dealing with them and when you're actually partaking them and, and yourself. Um, it, it makes it very easy to, you know, dissect a debate. Mm-hmm. When people are throwing, you know, ad hominem tax at you like, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. Uh-huh. That's an ad hominem attack, meaning you don't like my message. So you're going to label me some right. label. You know, it's no different than label. You're fat. We, uh, so I don't agree with you. I mean, it's the same thing. Well, Monday through Friday, that's a conspiracy? No, it's a fact. That's, mm-hmm. that's a fact. Money is paper based on a belief. That's a fact. You are not free, even though you're told you're free. Take off your license plate. Stop paying your taxes. See how free you are. Exit the country without a passport and try to come back in without it. See how free you are. Mm-hmm. So these, once you be able to see these biases in action, it becomes easier to have a conversation. It becomes easier to dissect fact from fiction. It becomes easier to debate, debate haters. I mean, whatever, whatever you have there. So again, it all comes down to education. Mind less the, the, the fallacies and biases that come into play. There's a couple of books that I can uh, throw out there of that. There's two books called Dumbing Us Down and Weapons of Mass Instruction. Those mm-hmm. are about how the, how the education system is you know, turning our kids into robots and factory workers. Sure. And so that, those are a couple of books that are really. Uh, I got to write those down. I like the way they sound. What are they again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Dumbing us down and weapons of mass instruction. I Gato is the author. Those are a couple of really good books. Um, anything that's by John Halt. He's, he's, he was an educator that kind of, they kind of call him the inventor of unschooling, which mm-hmm. is basically this concept not that school doesn't happen, but that education can happen anywhere. 
Uh, so, I mean, people hear the word unschool and they go, oh, well, I, I can't do that. My kids need to have school. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that. It means that if you, if you spend the day at the, at the zoo, your kids are learning. Or if you, yeah. you know, spend it, the day doing art projects, your kids are learning. That allows you to be able to, to teach your kids that you don't have to rely on a system. You don't have to rely on what other people are telling you what you're supposed to learn. You yeah. can explore what you want to learn and and then base your education on the opportunities that are available, you know, so that you, you can learn what is relevant and not yeah. just what you're told to learn. And you and you just brought up a point that about um unschooling and about the education system you called the uh, Weapons of mass instruction. Mm-hmm. I, well, I can tell you, I don't even have to read that. To to be able to tell that, it's a, probably about how we're teaching our kids not to be proactive in our life. We're teaching them to be victims. Yeah. You're a victim of uh, corporatism. You're a victim of the government. You're a victim of oppression. You're a victim of this. This We're creating a victimology in our kids that... They're just, you know, they're they're just pieces of driftwood down a flowing mm-hmm. river, and uh, we have to fight that. Yeah. You know, not you, you have to become a CEO of your life, and yeah. be a proactive decision maker that you can you can dictate where your life goes. You are not a victim. Yeah, you don't have to have this fixed mindset that yeah, if somebody tells you, oh, you're so smart, or or not, <laughs> the yeah. other way. That you're stuck that way. You don't have to believe that narrative. That yeah, the, the, that. the there's a there's a, a corollary in my second book on script called the cancer corollary. Mm-hmm. If you have if you have cancer, God forbid, and someone is offering the cure, you're not going to look at that person and say, "Oh, gee, you're a Democrat. I don't want the cure." <laughs> Right. Oh, you're a Republican. Oh my, or, or you're white, you're black, you're Asian. I don't want the cure. You no, know, right. if you have something that people want, like desperately want, your backstory generally goes out the window. So right. if you hated creating that cure, you absolutely, you know, wasn't do what you love. It was you actually hated every second <laughs> of creating that cure. The person who wants it still is not going to care. They don't care if you have bad breath. They don't mm-hmm. care if you struck out on the T-ball team. They don't care about anything other than what can you give to me that will improve my life. So that's why all these stories of being a victim or being, you're this, you're that, the identity of, of victimhood, the identity of being, um, being something, or oh, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert. Right. All that goes out the window. When you create something that people want. Yeah, and I think that you can create something that is your unique to you, right? It can, it can speak to whatever it is that is your, I I mean, I'm, I want to avoid the word passion because you talk about how, you know, if you just, you just pursue your passion, well, then your possession, your passion fizzles out when it's attached to a need for a paycheck. But at the same time, you have a unique voice Mm -hmm. that you can, you can find the thing that you have the power to, to create sure and when you when when the marketplace reverberates back mm. that you have given value to them it's very it's 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 part of what's called a feedback loop yeah um which is why i believe that do what you love and follow your passion is a bunch of bunk mm-hmm. um, because winning inspires passion yeah uh, when you look at a professional baseball or professional sports team when they're losing they're absolutely miserable Right. Well, can't we assume they're passionate about playing the game? Well, see, if you're losing, it's not passionate. Right. So winning is, is what inspires passion. So if you're doing something that you necessarily aren't in love with, but it's providing value and you're winning at it, you will feel passion. I still, to this day, do a lot of stuff I do not like. Mm-hmm. Do a lot of stuff that I would, like, I, some, once in a while I get stuck doing some stupid invoices for some book publishers, for some book wholesalers. Right. I hate doing it. <laughs> but I still do it because it's simply it's, it's not feasible to hire somebody because it's only a short, takes me 25 minutes, but I hate doing 25 minutes. Well, and there's that quote that's like opportunity. People don't 
don't listen to opportunity because it's dressed as overalls and looks like work or something yes. like that. You know, yes. it doesn't have to be an easy. It, it's a fairy tale to think you're going to build this spectacular business that makes millions and millions of dollars and you're going to have fun the entire time because you're passionate about it. Right. Bunch of BS. Mm-hmm. No, do the damn work. Do what's uncomfortable do what needs to be done and you will get there. Just do the damn work. It's like, yeah. it's like going to the gym. It's not fun, but eventually when you start to see the results, yeah, you're like, Oh wow, this is great. This, you know, eating the broccoli isn't so bad because now all of a sudden I'm starting to see the effect of my work. Again, we go back to process, process, yeah. process, process. Yeah. And then, and also having a vision because like, for example, with this going to the gym, you think, well, I, w- I need to get into shape. I want to be at a certain dress size or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's kind of widely known in the fitness world that you're going to hit a plateau, right? Mm-hmm. But, but instead of going, well, I guess this is as, much, this is as far as I can go. No, you, you, you've got to figure out what the, you know, how to get over those obstacles because there are tools, there are resources, there's knowledge, there's education that will help you to overcome those obstacles and yeah. instead of them being stumbling blocks, they can be stepping stones to, to get deeper into your vision and your goals. And the plateau is actually there to stop you. It is there to show you how bad you want it mm. or don't want it. Because I'm telling you, everybody goes through the plateau. I call it the desert of desertion. Mm-hmm. That's when you're working, you're grinding, you're hustling, and there's no feedback loop. Yeah. There, there's nothing. You look in the mirror and you don't look like you've changed. You, right. you get on the scale, it hasn't, it's gone down a half a pound. That's the desert of desertion mm-hmm. when it's trying to get you to quit. So you just have to continue to operate until you get your first echo, which is part of the feedback loop. The echo is someone, hey, you lost weight or look great. Oh, hey, the, you know, the scale went down a couple pounds or, yeah. or hey, your product really helped me. Uh, how do I buy your product? Right. When the market starts to bounce back to you, feedback of what you're doing so that's very important if you act until echo you eventually will get to where you want to go you'll create the momentum that creates the change awesome wonderful thank you so much mj this has been really great can you tell us again where we can find you fastlingform.com and it is free Uh, there's an insider subscriber part uh, which is completely optional Uh, there's tons and tons of free information um, uh, people are doing what exactly what I've just talked about for the last hour. So anyone's free to join there at any time. And I, and I hang out there. Uh-huh. I'm there every single day. So if you, you like what I responded said, to one of my comments once and I was like, whoa, you responded. That's good. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, that's, and that's part of the relative value, uh, You're not, you know, you're not going to get that from any other author. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I make a point of being there and interacting with my readers and, 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 and you know, giving my opinion here and there. Awesome. Well, I'll include a link to the fastlaneforum.com in my show notes and also links for your books. Any last words of wisdom that you would want to uh, say? Look at, look at the world as problems waiting to be solved. Solve problems and you will set yourself free. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was fun. I had a, had a good time. Thank you again for listening. I had a great time talking with MJ. Be sure to come on to homeandfamilyculture.com and read the show notes and see the books that we talked about and also to check out links to get his books because they are a must read. Thank you again for listening. Please like and share.